Hello and welcome everyone to this DuPont Nomex webinar. My name is Rich and I'm a senior manager with IEEE Global Spec. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Roger Wicks is the global technical marketing manager for DuPont Nomex. Roger is a DuPont veteran of more than 35 years. Roger has held numerous technical and marketing positions in support of electrical insulation materials used in transformers and rotating machines. Roger currently chairs IEC and IEEE working groups on insulation aging and is currently the technical committee chair for IEC TC112. In these roles, he is actively leading industry efforts in designing new test methods for evaluating insulation systems for emerging applications. Roger received his BS in chemical engineering from Montana State University and his MBA in management from Golden State University in California. And with that, I'd like to pass things along to Roger to get things started. Roger, go right ahead. In 2012, we provided a presentation discussing new requirements for electrical equipment and how DuPont described materials and system testing along with new product development to assist designers of electrical equipment to address these trends in the market. In 2015, we provided a presentation on how to select the correct insulation material. Today, we will expand upon these discussions and describe new test methods for evaluating materials and systems, as well as techniques for optimizing the use of materials used in electrical equipment. I will cover the following topics. Broad range of materials used in electrical equipment. Testing of insulation materials for electrical equipment. Optimization of insulation dielectric requirements. Optimization of insulation mechanical requirements. Evaluation of insulation system life, current and future standard methods. For the last 50 years, DuPont has been a leader in the development of electrical insulation materials used in the manufacturing of electrical equipment, with many of the most well-known brands of materials invented by DuPont. Nomex brand paper and press board, Kapton polyimide film, Mylar polyester film, Tedlar polyvinyl fluoride film, Additionally, there are a wide range of engineering polymers which are DuPont materials used in the manufacture of electrical equipment, including Rhinite PET polyester, Craston PBT polyester, and Zytel nylon engineering polymers. With this broad range of electrical insulation materials, DuPont materials are used in almost every type of electrical equipment. In some cases, the best material for an application is one of these materials by itself. In other applications, the best material is a combination of more than one of these materials. In the 50 plus years that DuPont has been producing electrical insulation materials, DuPont has developed expertise in the development, testing, and manufacturing of materials used in electrical equipment as both individual materials and as components of integrated insulation systems. In many electrical applications, DuPont materials and systems have set the benchmark for the production of electrical equipment. Such expertise is also used to assist our customers in helping them optimize the use of our materials and to provide a comparison of our materials to alternative options. Because of the breadth of applications where DuPont materials have been used, our technical personnel and laboratories have developed testing capabilities to allow quick evaluation techniques to evaluate materials and systems of materials covering this range of applications. Insulation materials used in electrical equipment are subjected to a number of stresses during the manufacturing process and then during the long-term operation of the equipment. A thorough evaluation of the insulating material should simulate both of these conditions to make sure that the material will provide the long-term protection needed to produce reliable equipment. The testing is broken up into short-term and long-term evaluations. For the short-term evaluations, basically the properties of the material as received, we look at both electrical and mechanical testing. The electrical properties include dielectric strength, impulse dielectric strength, dissipation factor, dielectric constant, as well as corona, partial discharge, inception and extinction voltages. The mechanical properties include tensile strength and elongation at break, tear strength, both initial and propagation, puncture resistance, and stiffness. We can also look at the effect of temperature for both short and long-term durations. When one considers optimization of insulation materials for an existing application, 
you should compare the alternatives to the incumbent material, but you need to make sure you understand the most important metrics, some of which will be discussed in subsequent slides. This chart shows the dielectric strength of Nomex paper across a range of paper thicknesses. If your experience is in the range of 10 to 15 mils and you stay in this area, any design rules that were developed with this experience would hold. But what happens if you get outside of the box, as shown in this plot? Perhaps you need to relook at your design limits to make sure they still apply. This in part is why we typically optimize in a stepwise process. Even within one region, there is a possibility of the test method varying. For example, within ASTM international standards, there are seven different electrode configurations for testing dielectric strength and eight different methods for determining the thickness of a product. One can test dielectric strength under laboratory conditions, using equipment designed for this testing, or on a factory test floor under variable temperature and humidity using equipment typically used to test electrical equipment without using electrodes. Finally, what is the voltage range of the equipment versus the product being tested? Is the product breaking down at 1,000 volts with a machine that ranges from 0 to 50,000 volts? So how likely is it that the volts per mil of one product is directly comparable to the results from a different product or supplier? This slide shows examples of different electrodes used for dielectric strength testing. On the left is the most common electrode setup for ASTM D149 2-inch electrodes, whereas in the middle, the picture shows the electrode commonly used for IEC dielectric strength testing, 1-inch to 3-inch electrodes. Finally, on the right is a picture of curved electrode used for the aging of materials. The graph shows that the range of dielectric test results in the same lab under the same rate of rise and environmental conditions with only different electrodes used in the test. The data shows a range of values from these different electrodes which points out the need to make sure that you know what method is used for the testing and in the best case you should get a direct comparison using the same test equipment and method. One final aspect of this discussion on testing. Dielectric strength is a function of the applied duration. For short duration, such as impulse dielectric strength at 1.2 by 50 microseconds, a material will have a very high dielectric strength. For a longer duration, such as rapid rise quality control test, the failure will occur in 10 to 20 seconds. Finally, under long term, low voltage stress, the failure could take years. This curve shows this relationship pictorially. Testing with air as an insulating medium will give much lower numbers than materials tested in a liquid, such as mineral oil type environment. If one considers the previous discussion on dielectric strength values for insulation materials, we note that there are a range of dielectric data for any given material depending on the duration of test, the electrode configuration, and the testing medium. In many cases, engineers use the ASTM D149 breakdown values as a basis for comparison since this data is so readily available. Let's consider where dielectric requirements of the insulation come into play. The following items are of importance, high potential testing, dielectric design limits, and partial discharge inception voltage, PDIV. High potential testing, commonly known as a high pot test, is typically used as a quality control test to ensure that no mechanical damage has been suffered by the insulation during the manufacturing process of producing the electrical equipment. The high pot test level is related to the operating voltage of the electrical equipment. For example, NEMA MG1 2007 defined high potential test as test which consists of the application of a voltage higher than the rated voltage for a specified time for the purpose of determining the adequacy against breakdown of insulating materials and spacings under normal conditions. The standard list as an example for a 400 volt motor, the high pot test would be 1000 volts plus two times the rated voltage or a total of 1800 volts. Since motors and transformers are typically high pot tested before the varnish impregnation step in the process, this test must be passed without the benefit of enhanced dielectrics from the impregnating varnish. Additionally, this test is typically of one minute in duration. 
So the typical dielectric strength values from a product data sheet for an insulation may not be helpful in selecting materials to pass the test. Passing this test, however, is typically not a problem, but there could be scenarios where an open, saturable product is desired. Impregnating resins can be filled to improve thermal conductivity. In such a case, a modified test program might be needed, say a lower high pot for QC, followed by a second high pot after impregnation and cure to meet the industry requirements. There are a number of dielectric parameters needed by the designer beyond and including the need for, to pass the high pot test. As insulation suppliers, we provide information to customers upon request related to one minute withstand values, impulse dielectric strength, etc. The specifics of dielectric designs are too detailed for this overview presentation. We provide assistance to customers on the use of Nomex paper in motor and transformer applications. This assistance provides dielectric test values for our papers under a number of conditions, but also helps the engineer understand safe operating voltages that are more related to the design of the equipment. In this area, one of the key parameters is the partial discharge inception voltage, or PDIV. The recognition of the use of PDIV testing of electrical equipment and insulation materials has been growing due to the increase of failures of electrical equipment due to the use of inverters. These inverters cause overvoltage spikes which then create a situation where an insulation system which has been designed to be PD free will encounter it. This leads to premature failure. There are a growing number of groups who are developing standards around equipment to ensure PD-free operation. The first is the IEC Technical Committee for Rotating Machines, IEC TC2, which developed IEC 60034 Part 18-41, Rotating Electrical Machines, Qualification and Type Tests for Type 1 Electrical Insulation Systems Used in Rotating Electrical Equipment, Machines Fed from Voltage Converters. Another example is an SAE AE8D group which is developing a document which looks at minimum PDIV levels for aircraft wiring. Most of the product testing looks at the PDIV of equipment as built and the equipment is typically tested new. However, the PDIV values will change depending on the operating conditions and this is not always well understood. This is important when one considers optimization. The electrical breakdown properties of materials are affected by a number of conditions. The first of these is temperature. There are known relationships related to the breakdown of materials versus temperature. In a recent set of experiments, we looked at the relationship of PDIV versus temperature in motorette testing. This testing involved evaluating the phase-to-phase -phase and phase-to-ground PDIV level at temperatures ranging from 25C to 180C. As seen in the figure, the PDIV value at 180C is 80% of the room temperature result. We saw a similar reduction in PDIV values when testing sheet materials, such as Nomex paper or laminates like NMN, that are typically used in industrial motors. The second effect that is discussed is that of the effect of lower partial pressure of air on the PDIV results. One classic example of this would be aircraft wiring, which is perhaps part of the reason for the new document being developed within SAE. In the same test that evaluated the effect of temperature, we also looked at the effect of pressure on the PDIV of the motorette samples. In this test, we evaluated the samples under laboratory pressure, one bar, and then reduced the pressure in a chamber all the way down to 0.4 bars. In this test, the PDIV value was reduced to 70% of the room temperature value. The final effect that should be considered is the effect of aging on the insulation material or system. At DuPont, we've conducted aging on both motors and motorettes, and as seen in this chart, we see a reduction in the PDIV value over the course of aging. This plot compared the result of the impregnated motorettes with one set of motorettes insulated with Nomex paper and the other motorette insulated with a laminate of Nomex and pen film polyethylene naphthalate. This testing was conducted as part of an evaluation for an electric vehicle motor. 
in this case the PDIV of the N pen N was higher than that for the equivalent thickness of Nomex paper, but with aging due to the lower thermal capability of the pen film, the PDIV of the laminate becomes lower than the Nomex Type 410 paper. The reduction of the N pen N was in the order of nearly 50% during the accelerated aging program which simulated the life of the insulation system. PDIV is one tool that is being used to evaluate insulation materials and insulation systems. As one tries to optimize an insulation system, this in fact may be the limiting dielectric parameter. One must be careful to recognize all the factors which may affect PDIV when optimizing to make sure that the material has enough extra capability margin to last through the life of the equipment under all the conditions that apply. IEC 60034 Part 18-41 recognize these issues and notes in the normative Annex B that there should be a safety factors applied to PDIV measures for these and other issues such as repeatability of the test, etc. They recommend a safety factor of 1.3 be used. This consideration may not take into account the aging of the materials which could also be a significant effect as was discussed. At DuPont, we have conducted testing of materials, systems, and complete electrical equipment to help with this evaluation. This data has been used by engineers to confirm their insulation and to provide tools to allow optimization in the future. Early in this webinar, we listed key mechanical properties for insulation materials used in electrical equipment. When one works to optimize insulation used in an application, Often one of the mechanical properties becomes a limiting factor well before the electrical properties. We will discuss a couple of mechanical properties typically of concern in the manufacturing process, initial tear strength and stiffness. For the stiffness discussion, we will introduce a new test method we recently developed to assist customers with optimizing insulation in automated manufacturing process. In a number of discussions with customers, the initial tear property of the insulation material is one of the key mechanical properties with which to optimize. This chart shows two sets of initial tear property results for Nomex paper as a function of basis weight. The first observation is that the more material, the stronger the sheet. On a simplistic scale, this suggests that an engineer could simply run a series of experiments with different papers, and once failure occurs, could then use data like this to establish minimum requirements for continued operation. However, this plot shows two sets of data for the same papers, demonstrating that there is an optimum orientation of the paper in the application. This is not always practical, but in most cases, insulation materials can be fabricated to take advantage of the improved performance in one direction versus another. There are a number of stories of working with customers, both motors and transformers, where changing the orientation of the sheet either improved manufacturability for their production or allowed an engineer to use a thinner material for their application. For some applications, thicker materials must also be optimized in terms of mechanical performance. Again, here we look at the initial tear resistance of materials, both papers and laminates. As with the thin papers, we see two main themes. Thicker is better, and there is a directionality to the data. Thinner in application is always better, so in order to reduce thickness, one must still orient the material in the optimum direction. The addition of film in laminate form does improve tear properties, but other factors like orientation and thickness are equally important. One of the key parameters related to how well an insulating material can insert into a motor slot is to understand how stiff the paper is. Typically, thicker materials are stiffer than thinner materials. In the past, we have used a number of test methods such as Gurley or Tabor stiffness to measure stiffness. But these methods are really bending resistance tests. Here's an example of such data for different thicknesses of Nomex paper. This graph shows test data for a range of materials, both papers and laminates, that all have similar thicknesses. In this test, our higher density Type 410 paper performs somewhat lower than NMN laminates of similar thicknesses. 
this shows that the addition of polyester film helps improve the bending resistance. One issue is how to use this data to help optimize the manufacturing process. The output from this test provides a relative performance but does not provide a measure of how much force a paper can withstand on end before crushing. A second issue is that thick films will not always be available or cost effective in some applications requiring high thermal class materials. Our goal was to identify ways of measuring the maximum amount of force which could be applied to the end of a slot liner or wedge without causing the wedge to buckle. To do this we considered crush testing, however most of these methods were designed to look at sheets of materials such as corrugated boxes or honeycomb and still didn't give us what we were looking for. Using a 3D printer we designed a tube that could be sized to simulate a long slot within a motor. We developed a test that could be applied using our Instron tensile tester to measure the resistance of different materials to compressive force simulating those encountered during slot insertion. These pictures show the equipment as well as some of the example test pieces. This graph shows some of the initial data from our column strength test. There are a couple of key findings from this test. The first is that there is a clear improvement in the column strength with thickness as would be expected. This should be no surprise as this mirrors the experience seen in an application. When a paper doesn't work, thicker materials are typically used and they work. Now, we may have a predictive test that can be used to optimize the selection of best materials for each application. Additionally, this data shows that the directionality of the samples was not a dominant factor, which is good because, as was previously mentioned, directionality is important when it comes to tear strength. Future testing could also look at the effective speed on the test, which may provide input on how or if the insertion speed of the material can be increased to assist with productivity. We will attempt to model and then compare our data with real-world testing. Pretty cool stuff. This graph shows four products of similar thickness to see if the materials of construction can affect this result. In the case of our higher density type 410 paper performs similar to the NMN laminates of similar thickness. This shows that the addition of polyester film helps improve the column strength but only to a small degree. This may be useful for some applications where such constructions are suitable. There are a myriad of variables which could be tested. We are quite excited about the possibilities of such testing. Finally, not all materials will test the same. We evaluated other high density papers which purport to be similar to our Nomex papers and their test values were less than half of that of the same thickness of Nomex paper. As was discussed in the previous charts related to stiffness, there are industry established methods which do a good job of demonstrating the relative stiffness of one material versus another. We have presented data from the Tabor stiffness test. What is missing in this data is a finite number that can be used to set up operating equipment such as auto insertion equipment for motor manufacturing. In this graph we show both sets of data for Nomex paper of different thicknesses and the relative performance is clearly related. However, if one converts Tabor stiffness units to pounds force, you get a number that is so low, less than one pound for the 15 mil type 410, versus a number of around 75 pounds for our column test, that you're really looking at apples and oranges. The equipment designer must know the amount of force that can be used to push the paper into the slot, and it is not one half of a pound. Our result is much closer to the reality needed. As mentioned, we are working to optimize this test to provide even more meaningful data. For the first part of the optimization of insulation materials, the material must make it through the manufacturing process having adequate mechanical strength and have enough dielectric properties to withstand the quality control processes for the electrical equipment. Design parameters must also be met such as having enough material with margin for the insulation system to stay PD free during the life of the motor or transformer. Depending on the voltage class of the equipment and the type of design factors, 
the limiting factor in optimization may be the mechanical properties or it may be the electrical limitations, including PDIV. With the exception of the discussion of the effect of aging on the PDIV value of a system, we have not addressed the final key area in evaluating insulation and system performance, life estimation and validation. Now that we have discussed attributes related to the manufacturing and testing of the electrical equipment, now we need to circle back and consider how to make sure that the insulating materials and systems are designed to meet the life requirements of the equipment into which they are installed. The basis of estimating long-term thermal capability of a material or a system is to conduct accelerated aging at temperatures above the expected application temperature. This allows a predicted life in a time frame that is much shorter than the real-time operation. The materials are aged at three or four temperatures until end of life, typically 50% of the original property value is reached. These half-time periods are recorded and plotted against the inverse temperature, reciprocal of absolute temperature, to obtain the Arrhenius curve. This shows graphically such an experiment conducted for Nomex paper over 50 years ago, data which supports the 220C rating for our papers. This plot shows dielectric strength retention over 10 years at 220C based on the extrapolation of test data ranging from 260 to 320C. There are a number of industry standards which have been developed to conduct testing to do just this, determine the thermal capability of the materials and systems. The next two pages list some of the principal IEEE and UL standards which are used to evaluate the thermal capability of materials and systems. You see here listed a number of IEEE standards. And here we have a continuation of the IEEE list as well as a couple of the most important UL standards. There are also a number of standards within IEC that will be discussed in more detail. Many of these standards have been in existence since the 70s or so, with subsequent revisions, so they are all well accepted in the industry. However, there are today situations where these standards do not necessarily meet the requirements of new electrical equipment. For the next few slides, we will describe work underway, which relates to insulation system testing for motors used in electric vehicles. In many cases, with new applications such as electric vehicles, the initial insulation system design is gold-plated to make sure there are no possible failures. This likely will apply with new designs for any type of electrical application. However, when high volume is expected, then optimization is then needed to produce motors as cost-effectively as possible while still meeting the requirements of the application. This requires standardized methods for evaluating the insulation system life. Estimation of Electrical Insulation System, EIS, lifetimes was developed over 40 years ago, IEEE 117, IEC 61857 Part 21, and UL 1446 have all been developed around this original methodology. Each use common approaches, involving thermal aging of a combined material, followed by diagnostic stresses, vibration, cold shock, humidification, and a dielectric withstand test that are designed to determine end of life of the EIS, which may or may not be the same as the end of lifetime of the motor, but are also designed in part to model the application for which the methods were developed, industrial motors. These tests provide a relative thermal index, RTI, by comparing a candidate system to a known system which has a typical lifetime in the range of 20,000 hours. In the case of motors used in electric vehicles, there are a number of differences versus those seen in industrial motor applications, yet there has been no established method to evaluate the insulation systems for motors in these applications. At DuPont and likely other testing laboratories, we have developed customer testing protocols to evaluate the insulation system for these applications. These evaluations have attempted to modify the testing protocol consistent with the different threats seen in the motor applications. The threats include higher vibration, more thermal cycling, over voltage due to the effect of inverters, and finally, exposure to fluids such as automatic transmission fluids, ATF which are used as a coolant in many motor designs. 
Our testing labs have set up to do these system tests using both the motoret type samples used in conventional systems evaluations, as well as testing motor stators off of production lines. We have tested motors with significantly higher g-forces than those of conventional motorette tests, as well as tested systems under the effect of ATF environment. These test programs have helped motor engineers confirm their insulation system choices for use in their electric vehicle motors. So this begs the question, how to do this as a standard rather than as a one-off custom evaluation within the IEC TC-112 the International Electrotechnical Commission Technical Committee that deals with the evaluation and qualification of electrical insulating materials and systems. We are working to develop the standardized testing framework to conduct these tests. Working Group 6 of TC-112, which includes personnel from DuPont and many other industry companies, is working on these new approaches. IEC TC-112 recently published the first of three documents designed to standardize the informal approaches to systems evaluation for this application and other emerging applications with life cycles that are shorter than those for conventional products. The first document, IEC 61857 Part 31, is titled Electrical Insulation Systems, Procedures for the Thermal Evaluation, Part 31, Applications with a Designed Life of 5,000 Hours or Less. The premise of this document, if my life requirement differs from the typical 20,000 hour life used in methods such as IEC 61857 Part 21, how do I conduct testing for shorter life requirements, such as the EV, HEV motors? For some applications, the life requirements are shorter than the longest aging period required in Part 21, 5,000 hours. In the case of EVHEV motors, the typical requests range from 5,000 to 10,000 hours due to the actual running time of the motors. At 60 miles per hour and 120,000 miles, you would get 2,000 hours. So a 5 to 10,000 hour motor life seems reasonable as a starting point. This standard describes a method to evaluate systems with shorter lifespans than typical systems testing in a way that industry experts agree upon. The next document under development, still at the committee draft stage, is IEC 61857 Part 32, which is titled Electrical Insulation Systems Procedure for Thermal Evaluation Part 32, Multifactor Evaluation by Diagnostic Procedures. This document in part addresses the different threats that a motor sees in application. The standard as planned outlines how to evaluate the insulation system with conventional aging like would be seen in 61857 Part 21, but to use more severe diagnostics, higher vibration, more severe cold shocker cycles, higher voltage dielectric tests, etc. This document is expected to be completed in the near future. This graph shows how, with more severe diagnostics, the performance of the system is expected to be different than under normal diagnostics, but to follow the same slope. This assumption will, of course, be verified during initial evaluations using this methodology. The final document under development, also in committee draft stage, is IEC 61857 Part 33, which is titled Electrical Insulation Systems, Procedure for Thermal Evaluation Part 33, Multifactor Evaluation with Increased Factors at Elevated Temperature. The expectation of this test would be to allow the evaluation of the insulation system, motorette or motor, where there are more than just thermal stresses being applied to the sample during the aging process. This could include exposure to ATF, exposure to voltages, etc., and the methodology would then describe how to conduct this type of testing in a standardized methodology. The sample shown here is of a motorette type sample that has been exposed to ATF fluid during the course of the aging program. A graph similar to as was shown for Part 32 could be expected to be generated with Part 33. What may be different in this scenario is that the expectation of a similar slope could be different, so more data may be required to confirm this supposition. At DuPont, we have conducted testing that could follow each of the three methods described. This testing is being conducted in collaboration with the designer of motors 
so specific data cannot be provided. In some cases, we have tested motors, and in other cases, motorettes. It was testing conducted at DuPont and at other testing laboratories, such as LTEC Laboratories, Inc., that led to the development of these new test methods. The most common requests have been around ATF compatibility and evaluation of the electrical insulation under more severe diagnostics, such as the higher vibration, though the range of testing has been significant. In every case, we likely use some component of the three new IEC methods. For example, in Part 32, it would be expected that the system would be evaluated first with conventional diagnostics, and then as a second, shorter evaluation could be conducted with the more severe diagnostics, and the offset in performance at perhaps just one aging temperature could then calculate the expected life of the system in a much quicker fashion. In many cases, there already exists systems performance data for the motors used in the EVHEB, but not with the severe diagnostics. So this would allow quicker life estimates. In most of our tests, this is a new application, so there was no baseline performance for the testing. In the future, when engineers consider new designs because of changing conditions, such as higher voltage as an example, this could then be evaluated very quickly by comparing to our initial results. One could even perhaps test a range of systems with ever increasing diagnostic stresses to see at what point a critical issue is reached. One specific example of multi-factor aging would be the combination of temperature and a hostile environment beyond that of temperature alone. In many motor designs used for electric vehicles, the motors are made more compact by employing direct cooling of fluids impacting the motor windings. Commonly used fluid includes ATF, automatic transmission fluids. Over the years, DuPont has evaluated a number of different ATF options for motor companies using a variety of conditions. In each of these evaluations, Nomex has proven to be fully compatible with the test conditions requested. The graph here shows an example of one such test where Nomex paper was essentially unaffected and other materials were degraded to some degree or another. The specifics of the test conditions were excluded from this plot per the customer's request. We continue to perform this type of testing for customers and are looking to improve our capabilities to better model the end use application to allow continued optimization by customers. DuPont is working with engineers in the design and manufacturing of a wide range of electrical equipment in a number of ways. This includes helping with the qualification of the materials and systems for new insulation requirements such as the hybrid electric vehicles, as well as developing systems knowledge for applications ranging from inverter duty motors to liquid immersed power transformers. This work includes not just testing of materials, but working with industry colleagues to develop test methodology to make sure the evaluation of such systems can be conducted in a standardized method representative of the application. If you have an idea where you think DuPont can help you optimize your use of electrical insulation materials, or if you're interested in these industry standards, contact us at the web address listed in the final slide. Great. Thanks, Roger. That was a very informative session. We've had several questions coming in along the way, so I hope you don't mind spending some time with us this morning answering some of these questions. Um, here's one. You spent a lot of time discussing PDIV and the reasons why this is important. What can I do to increase the, PDI the PDIV level in my motors? Thanks. Um, there are a number of factors which affect the PDIV of a motor as tested on the factory floor. As discussed, temperature is one factor. Another is the repeatability of the test. Other factors relate to the materials and the design of the motor. On a simplistic standpoint, the thicker the material, the lower the voltage stress and the lower the PDIV. The quality of impregnation may be another factor. The design of the motor may not always allow thicker insulation, heavier wire, etc., and the impregnation method may be fixed. We have provided test data for our materials that the engineers can use as they evaluate different options. Great, that, thank you. That was a very thorough answer. Um, here's another question. This column strength test you described sounds interesting. Can I get a copy of your method so I can conduct similar testing? 
Our plans are to continue to work with customers to develop this methodology to gain enough experience with the testing to verify the suitability of the test versus applications and to understand the repeatability of the test. As we gain this experience, we expect to share our methods with customers and industry partners to further our understanding about the suitability of this test. At DuPont, we have a history of working to develop test methods up to and including developing industry standards related to new test methods. In fact, as was mentioned in the webinar, we're very supportive of the work within IEC TC 112 to develop new insulation test protocols as an example. That's terrific. Thanks, Roger. Yeah, I think that information will be helpful once we can start to share some of that. Um, here's another question. Earlier, you mentioned your involvement with the development of new test test methods for system testing within IEC TC 112. What other new test methods are being developed? Uh, I'm glad you asked this question. Um, there's a wide range of standards development within IEC in general and IEC TC 112 in specific. There would be a long list if I were to try and remember all of them. But I will mention a few. We recently completed work on an analytic test method for thermal evaluation, IEC 60216 Part 7, as well as some updated test methods for solid and liquid insulation systems within the uh, IEC 62332 series. There have also been some updates to the testing of dissipation factor, dielectric constant, and resistivities of materials, to name a few. With the addition of new applications like higher frequencies and even direct current versus AC, there are needs for new test methods for the evaluation of material. Wow, okay, yeah, it does sound like there's a lot of work going on um, with these new test methods. So here's a slightly different question. I'm interested in multi-factor aging of an insulation system as you described in your webinar. Can DuPont do this for me or can you recommend a third party? Um, as we discussed, we have conducted some very specific multi-factor aging for customers, typically a combination of temperature and chemical resistance. Other companies are doing multi-factor aging as is described in the webinar. At DuPont, we conduct testing at laboratories in the U.S. in Richmond, Virginia, in China in the Shanghai Pudong area, and in Switzerland outside of Geneva in Meirin. So for most companies, we have testing capability in the region of the request. I can discuss your application offline and give you options to consider. While, while we wait on the completion of the IEC 61857 Part 33, there is a document IEC 60505, the Evaluation and Qualification of Electrical Insulation Systems, which would provide some guidance on such testing. Excellent, very helpful. Okay, so here's another question. Does DuPont have combati compatibility data for specific fluids or its materials to show how its aging is affected when exposed to differing fluids? Um, DuPont has tested our insulating materials in a variety of fluids in support of the wide variety of applications where our products are used. In many cases, such as the ATF fluid described in the webinar, there are multiple suppliers, each with their own unique chemistry, so we have conducted a wide range of tests. In some cases, we can share our data, but each customer typically has unique requests. In some cases, we've tested new fluids, in some cases, used fluids, and of course, we've tested at a range of different times and temperatures. We have some general guidance we can provide regarding certain types of fluids, but with today's rapidly changing environment, we're often asked to test new fluids, which then, of course, would require new tests. Great, okay, thank you for that. Um, here's another question. In applications where there is a good deal of external stresses on the insulation application, is there data on how that affects the life of the insulating material? Yeah, so this is one of the things that we're looking at with the new test method IEC 61857 Part 32, which would then have uh, more severe diagnostics like temperature swings or higher vibration levels, which will simulate these external stresses as part of the diagnostic evaluation. 
or the 61857 Part 33, which would, in, it would simulate these stresses during the actual aging procedure. It would be expected in both cases that these increased stresses would reduce the life of the insulation system. And this is why we're developing these standards to answer this specific question. Great. Okay, here's another question. Um, what causes the reduction in PDIV value with aging that you described? Uh, uh, that's a, uh, a tricky question. Um, this is something we are studying to better understand. We know that this effect is real based on testing of motors and motorettes, yet when we have, uh, we haven't really been able to duplicate this when we test individual materials. So what might you say would be different in those two types of tests? In the case of the motor and motorette testing, we have more than just thermal aging. We're adding to this the effect of the diagnostics, the vibration, the cold shock. Would this be the cause perhaps because with thermal aging of materials just by themselves, we typically on we only have the thermal threat. And so it may be that this additional mechanical displacement from the vibration or the cold shock is what's causing the reduction in PDIV. What's interesting though is that for some applications like automotive, we're actually being asked to look at higher stress levels, higher vibration, up to 15 Gs, to better simulate the mechanical abuse seen in the over-the-road application. But we think this phenomena is real and we're just doing more work to try and understand the depth of it. Great, very thorough explanation, thank you. So we still have a few minutes left and there is time to ask questions. Um, so just use the Q&A on your um, screen to ask a question. All right, here's another one, Roger. I imagine that also mechanical and electrical properties is bonded. So is there also tables and data that explains this bonding? Um, so I'm not exactly sure 100% the the question, but uh, I'll, I'll attempt to answer it. Um, so in some cases, we have been asked to evaluate the combination of Nomex uh, where it's been coated with an impregnating resin as an example. And so, or you could say you could look at the effect of a laminate where you have Nomex and films that are combined together. And we've evaluated that I'll call simple combination. So it's not just an individual material, but it's a bonding material in combination with the Nomex. And so, yeah, we can do those type of evaluations. And it's probably important to do that with the specific supplier of the material you would be using because each bonding material might be different and you might get a different result. Great, thank you for that. Okay, so it looks like we just have one more question this morning. Um, what is the effect on dielectric strength if pressure goes to zero with an ultra high vacuum? So as was mentioned in the in the body of the webinar, the testing that we did of motorettes was down to 0.4 bars. We haven't extended it all the way down to close to zero. Um, I guess we could continue the testing uh, at lower vacuum levels. Um, it might be interesting to do so, and there might also be some. Um, texts where people have investigated such phenomena. I'll try and look some of that up and answer in writing as part of my answers to the webinar. Great. Thank you, Roger. So there's still time to ask some questions. I think what we'll plan to do is Roger will get back to and answer all of these questions um, in the next day or two. So you still have time to enter in your questions into the queue and Roger will get back to you. But Roger, thank you for your time this morning. This was a very thorough explanation and a very informative webinar and really appreciate you taking the time to spend the morning with us. Thank you. Thanks.